be here and, and to present some of our work to you. Uh, we're very humbled for your attendance and your time this evening. Um, I'm Ramsey Yasser and I'm the founder of Numa Studio. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary design collective set up in 2019. Um, and we, we we are concerned with um, taking on a, a human centric approach to design and that we have a real commitment to a more equitable and just future. Um, really, our beginnings are, are quite grassroots in a sense, and we, uh, you know, men, many of us kind of uh, met um, quite coincidentally. We, we, we lived together within London's informal warehouse districts and um, it, we kind of came together as, as, a, as a collective through that through that route over many years and in 2019 we kind of formalized our, our position as a collective much more so. Um, now I, I'm going to share with you a few of our projects that we uh, we've, we've recently done um, a few uh, the, the first two I'm going to share with you are going to be very short introductions to those um, and then I'm maybe going to share with you a short film as well on another project of ours that we've done for the East End Women's Museum and then I will uh, get take you into a more detailed um, presentation of uh, the big playground our intergenerational living um, uh, project that we did as a competition for Enfield Council um, and that gives quite a kind of nice um, overview of our approach as a studio and, and, and how we work. So Mosaicing Tales, um, this was a project that was undertaken on the um, border of East and West Jerusalem. Uh, and it really stemmed from a, an interest in politics and space. And, you know, th there is probably no better place on the planet to investigate uh, politics and space than Jerusalem. Um, through that project, so there was a real interest in, uh, we developed a real interest in folk arts and oral tradition. And this was something that we really identified on both sides of the border as being a very strong element of people sitting down to tell stories and to read and narrate the terrain. And the, the project culminated in a, in a hypothetical proposal on an Ottoman ruin that sat on this border and sat on the hilltops. And we crowned this ruin with an optical device that framed narratives um, across the landscape and within the hilltops. And this, this project very much uh, encapsulates our interests in storytelling, craft and materiality. Another project of ours, a story of togetherness, um, comes from a, a, a project that we had done previously called Circles. And, and this was all about regenerating a local high street to our studio in Tottenham um, uh, through um, waste aggregate taken from a local construction uh, waste site. Uh, and the the idea was is that we could take this construction waste and use it to to develop community led enterprise within this high street as a way of um, uh, as as a way of reactivating this high street and creating greater community cohesion within the area. Moving into a story of togetherness, this was really a project that was that was kind of uh, inspired or, or triggered by. Um, you know, the world events of 2020, um, we had uh, lockdown with, you know, massive issues of, of social isolation and loneliness. Um, you know, we, we had the rhetoric of, of Donald Trump, um, of division and difference and, uh, you know, building up walls between America and, and, and neighboring countries. Um, and really, we, we felt that that at that time, the, the concept of togetherness was such an important one. So um, we we took this waste aggregate that we've been working with and we've de been developing this new product with, and we decided to turn it into an artwork. And this artwork, um, uh, th this, this artwork came together. 
to form a complete whole. But we then took that and fragmented those pieces and distributed them amongst friends of the studio and and people who have, we, we've engaged with and who've, who've been really connected to our projects um, over the last couple of years and who've supported us through you know what is a very difficult time to be a startup studio. And the project's not over yet. The idea is is that everybody who received one of these tokens, as it were, or pieces of the story, are going to come back together and co-create a new story together once we're allowed to do so. Before I move on to the Big Plague brand, I'd like to share another quick project of ours, um, which is the uh, East End Women's Museum. And the reason I want to share this is because it gives a very good insight into our interests uh, within uh, co-creation and social justice uh, with, with the way that we work. Um, now, I'm going to uh, play this, but I would be grateful if somebody could tell me if it's not working or you can't hear it or something. We don't have a new sound. Oh, that's that's a shame. There should be sound. Um, OK, uh, I, I as I've not used this platform before, I won't try and do. Uh, I won't try and do anything um, technical on it, but the short of uh, the short of the Send Women's Museum um, was that this is very much a, a, a really interesting story for how this museum came about. Um, uh, w w there was supposed to be an East End Women's Museum commissioned back in 2015, and the um, the, the developers doing it um, obviously went through a viability exercise and suddenly decided that it made much more sense to deliver a, um, a Jack the Ripper museum, uh, and this was met with. Uh, massive uproar because you know it, instead of celebrating women they, they created a, a museum that was set up to celebrate violence against women um, so this this started off with a tweet and um, that the founder of the East End Women, Women's Museum kind of said let's let's rebuild one so over the last five years this has been a really big campaign that's been building um, and has uh, eventually culminated now into a, a capital project with, a, with an actual site and a budget. Um, unfortunately, we, we weren't successful in getting through to, to, the, uh, to actually winning this commission, but it was a, a really um, important uh, bid and project for us in terms of allowing us to really develop our discourse around co-design, co-creation, um, and and really about social justice issues um, and and how architecture and space can relate to those. Um, I will. Uh, we haven't actually published this yet, so this was very much a preview. But if you follow us on Instagram, you you'll see um, this video up on our Instagram in the next couple of weeks. So I, I urge you all to to follow our Instagram and, and give it a watch when it goes up. Okay, I'll go back to the main presentation now. So uh, moving into the big playground. Now, the big playground was a project about intergenerational living um, done for commissioned by Enfield Council and Metropolitan Thames Valley Housing Association. Um, and we were we were asked to consider um, some of the real um, uh, some of the real social issues that come with intergenerational living. Typically, when people talk about about um, you know intergenerational living, they they talk about it, the idea of kind of middle class families downsizing, um, uh, you know, elderly people downsi down, uh, downsizing into smaller places, living next to middle class families, assisting them with childcare, and there's this kind of lovely symbiotic relationship. 
But actually, one of the things that we found through our research is that intergenerational living is very much a question of choice. And actually, when you look at it in the context of somewhere like Enfield, specifically the, 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 the south east of Enfield, which is where our site was located, intergenerational living isn't always a choice. And actually, sometimes it's something that um, is, is a result of circumstance. And with that comes a number of issues, such as housing that isn't appropriate um, or, or uh, appropriate for those that way of living. And as I say, the site was, was in uh, South East Enfield here, Upper Edmonton, which lies within 10% of the most deprived wards in England. And the communities that, that were most, uh, most affected by intergenerational living within Enfield are Turkish, Black Caribbean, Somali and Asian communities. And along with this comes a health crisis. Enfield is very much, um, has a disproportionate um, uh, health crisis to the rest of the country. And, and, and that's made up by four key behaviors, which are physical inactivity, unhealthy eating, social isolation, smoking. And these lead to the, t to the, to the usual suspect five diseases, such as heart disease, cancer, um, type 2 diabetes. And these all result in 50% of the deaths within the borough. And we felt that, you know, the, the kind of London vernacular that's currently being produced, the, the typical housing type that's being done in kind of a lot of the regeneration projects, this very homogenized, standardized product. Um, is probably not fit for purpose and it, it doesn't address the nuances and complexities of different cultures, family settings and fam, um, family setups. Um, and we wanted to really uh, rekindle and celebrate some of the, the great um, social ideals of, 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 you know, the great modernist architects and social housing architects that, that came before. So, as I said in, in the introduction, Numa Studio has a, a really strong emphasis and a, a really big part of our, our process is around creating a more humanistic design process. And part of that process is developing uh, persona, is persona development. And that actually comes from, um, you know, this idea comes from some of our member, members who aren't all architects, by the way. And we have some members who work in tech. And actually, one of the really forward thinkings about uh, one of the really forward things about tech are their thinkings on um, user centric design and actually taking in the 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 uh, the needs and the the, the pain points of a, of a user to help you develop better design. And we feel that current architecture isn't developed in that way. So we developed four personas and, and they were developed from from engagement with um real people that we met on the on the proposal site uh they they were developed from um people that we've known as our from our own lived experiences um throughout our lives um and also uh, developed from ward data which gives us an idea of some of the kind of cultural mix-up of some of these um uh, some some of these these communities. So our four personas or four protagonists, as it were, were Holly, the millennial artisan, um, you know, a, a young person who is unable to get onto the property ladder. Um, she has a desire to be able to make an income from where she lives. And Chantel, um, Chantel was a young student. Um, uh, studying at a nearby nearby college, and she's a carer for her elderly grandmother uh, who who recently suffered from a stroke. Vashti represents the choice element of intergenerational living, um, and she's a, a a junior doctor at North Middlesex Hospital. Um, she and she's expecting her first child. And Unor is a second generation Turkish immigrant. Um, He's uh, currently working as an apprentice at a mechanics, and he lives in the most crowded household 
he lives with with, with um, multiple generations, his grandparents, his mother, and his two younger brothers. And this was our response to the needs of what we called the Enfieldians, our protagonists, the big playground. And this was really about creating a, a sandbox for all generations to come together and have visibility. And we felt that there was a really strong need for there to be this, this um, gradient of public to private space and there to be an interplay of these spaces. So we created staggered terraces with um, lush green um, uh, spaces to, to encourage biodiversity. One of the key things we identified through our research was, was this really amazing um, practice called neighbor culture, which is um, done amongst Turkish communities. Uh, and it's an opportunity for people to socialize and come together over cooking. Um, and, and many households will come together and, and bulk cook uh, particular ingredients and, and uh, dishes um, in order to socialize. So we integrate within our terraces, spaces and opportunities that allow for this culture to, to occur. A really strong element for us was creating a ground realm with um, a, a high level of amenity for the community, such as health centers, which takes uh, pressure off hospitals and allows people to have an immediate um, access to, to health. And we decided to activate the waterfront and to create uh, um, a, a series of live work ateliers across the waterfront where artisans can make and create and sell their, their creations. And within Big Playground, as well as having awesome play spaces for children, young families, there's also spaces for, for, for other activities and more inclusive activities such as gardening and uh, allotment space. We took the typical perimeter block that comes from the from the London vernacular that I'll talk about a bit more in a moment, and we we decided that you know that this this kind of um, uh, perimeter block is really not conducive to social cohesion, and we actually created characterful dense clusters. So we broke this up to accommodate, and we created a multi-level playground. So instead of this just being on 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 the ground plane, this is the playground is occurring in, in three-dimensional space, and these terraces and and uh, uh, um, semi-public and semi-private spaces create connected safe and secure spaces that are um, allow people to have to wave to neighbors to be able to to give natural surveillance to the public realm and on, along the waterfront here we decided to democratize the waterfront building. This is typically where you would put your highest ticket items, right? Your 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 most, you know, your private sale, highest uh, uh, bang for buck um, flats would normally be on the waterfront. And actually, we took the waterfront and gave it uh, to public use almost exclusively. So within this, we have a co-working space, we have a nursery, we have community beehives and then obviously we have these um, active frontages along the waterfront at the bottom so coming back to this idea of, of the london vernacular really what, what spurred this on um is in 2009 there was a development of um um the housing minimum standards by the mayor of london and the issue with these minimum standards is that what they do is they put an emphasis on area and you know this is very this is really good news for um you know your capitalist house builders uh your volume house builders who uh, want to be able to standardize a product um that can be rolled out and you know can just be super efficient with the way that that product is standardized but what we felt was is that it was it it didn't create housing that was conducive to well-being 
because for example you you might have within a um a minimum standard to say well your minimum floor to ceiling height is 2.4 meters well no developer is ever going to provide you a space of more than 2.4 meters in height because the, you know that that they don't have to but the problem is is that doesn't really allow for much deep penetration of light into the space so our proposal was about this idea of flipping it from area to volume and actually, if you start to think about housing from a volumetric sense, you are able to create much more culturally and needs uh, culturally specific and needs based housing. And this system that we created is is um, developable into a number of different uh, urban typologies, such as a courtyard, row house, tower. So going back to this idea of the well-being, we actually said, okay, well, we need to we need to subvert this um, this idea of the of the minimum standards and create a minimum standard for well-being. And this was made up of six core elements: the patio and external space, the the opportunity for um, additional natural light and warmth within a space, uh, split level, so that people so you're creating active spaces and active homes for people to be to be exercising, keeping fit as they move around and circulate their home. Dual aspect for healthy homes with um, good ventilation and airflow. And the idea of uh, personal to communicative space. So spaces that can give you some private space, but are still visually and uh, visually connected to another space to tackle issues of, of social isolation. And then also adaptability so that we're creating housing that can be adapted and developed um, as and when your family grows or sh shrinks. So approaching the end now, but this is the happy ending. The, these were um, the, uh, the, the housing types that we developed for our four protagonists using our, our volumetric system along with our standard for well-being. On Holly's place, we developed a multimodal housing type, and this goes from a living mode um, via this this sliding uh, wall into a workshop mode where she can create her crafts, and then it can also open up with these large windows onto the waterfront to create a kiosk mode so that she's able to sell her her crafts to to walkers by. In Uno's example. We created a uh, a courtyard which with which sits around two households, and this is this has the granny annex for his grandparents to be living in, but also um, has the family home for him, his mother, and his two little brothers. And um, one of one of the key elements again here is a sliding wall that allows space for children to play within the living room if they need to, but also for um, uh, for study, for private study if required. And sitting in the heart of the home, we have here the, the kitchen space, which can, which is visually connected to the living space and the, the, the sleeping quarters above. Chantal's Diggs uh, is a, um, is a, is a, is set on the ground floor of the, of the big playground. And Chantelle, as you may remember, her grandmother suffered from a stroke, so she required a fully accessible, um, uh, a fully accessible home. And uh, but at the same time, Chantelle, who's a, who's a student, very much requires her private space. So using our split level split level typology, we we actually position Chantelle half a level up. She has private space to study. This provides a, an almost double height space at the ground floor for deep penetration of light, but also she is able to be connected to her grandmother to address the issues of social isolation there. Finally, we have Vashti. And as I said before, Vashti represents the choice element of um, intergenerational living. She actually chooses to move in with her in-laws we have a community high street at the bottom where the in-laws um, uh, operate a pharmacy. And then one half a level up, the in-laws have their living quarters with their living room. 
Uh, the next level up at the heart of the home, again, we have the kitchen, which is culturally important to, to Vashti. And then the next level up, Vashti and her um, and her husband um, have their own their own quarters there. So this kind of really um, nuanced delineation of private and shared space. And then above that, um, we 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 propose this idea of having a um, a pre agreement pre planning agreement for a, a wiki house uh, type extension that allows Vashti to um, quickly throw up a, a panelized prefabricated uh, extension to their home when she has her baby. That concludes the presentation. Um, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of everybody at the uh, NUMA.